Molly is dead. Yes. To begin with, there's no doubt, whatever about that. The register of his burial is signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it. Marley's dead. That's a door now. Scrooge knows he's dead. Of course he does. How can it be otherwise? Scrooge and he were partners for I don't know how many years. Scrooge was his, his sole executor, his sole administrator, his sole assign, his sole residuary legatee. His sole friend. His sole mourner. Oh, he's a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone as Scrooge is squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covered as old sinner. Once upon a time, of all the good days of the year on a Christmas Eve, Scrooge sits busy in his counting house. It's cold, bleak. Biting foggy weather and the city clocks have just gone three, but it's quite dark already. The door of Scrooge's counting house is open so that he might keep an eye upon his clerk, who in a dismal little cell, a sort of a tank, is copying letters. Scrooge is a very small fire. But his clerk's fire is so very much smaller that it looks like one coal. But he can't replenish it. Scrooge keeps the coal box in his own room. And so soon as the clerk comes, with a sh comes in with a shovel, the master predicts it will be necessary for them to part. Whereupon the clerk puts on his white comforter and tries to warm himself at the candle in which effort not to being a man of strong imagination he fails. Merry Christmas, Uncle. God save you, cries the cheerful voice. It's the voice of Scrooge's nephew who has come upon him so quickly that this is the first intimation that Scrooge has of his approach. Bah, says Scrooge. Humbug. Christmas a humbug, Uncle. You don't mean that, I am sure I do. Out upon the Merry Christmas. What is Christmas time to you? But a time for paying bills without money. A time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer. A time for balancing your books and having every item in them through a round dozen of months presented dead against you. If I had my will, every idiot who goes about a merry Christmas on his lips, he should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart, so he should. Uncle, nephew, God, you keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Keep it. But you don't keep it. Well, let me leave it alone, then. Much good may it do you. Much good it has ever done you. There are many things from which I might have derived good by which I have not profited. I dare say Christmas among the rest. But I'm sure I have always thought of Christmas time when it has come around, apart from the veneration due to its sacred origin, if anything belonging to it can be apart from that, is a good time. Kind, cheerful, charitable, pleasant time, the only time I know of in the long calendar of the year when men and women seem, by one consent, to open their shut-up hearts freely and to think of people below them as if they really were fellow travellers to the grave and not of another race of creatures bound on other journeys. So, Uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe that it has done me good and it will do me good. And so I say, God bless it, the clerk and the tank involuntarily applaud. Let me hear another sound out of you and you'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. Your 
You're a very powerful speaker, sir. I wonder that you don't go into Parliament. Oh, come, Uncle, don't be angry with me. Dine with us tomorrow night. Good afternoon. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why cannot we be friends? Good afternoon. I'm sorry with my whole heart to hear you so resolute, but I have made the child an homage to Christmas. So I shall keep my Christmas humour till the last. So a Merry Christmas, good afternoon, and a Happy New Year, good afternoon. The nephew leaves the room without an angry word notwithstanding. The clerk in letting Scrooge's nephew out had let two other people in. They were portly gentlemen. Pleasant to behold, and they now stood with their hats off in Scrooge's office. They had books and papers in their hands, and they bowed to him. Scrooge and Marley's, I believe. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley has been dead these seven years. Died seven years ago this very night. Ha! Ah, oh, well, no doubt his liberality is well represented in his surviving partner. At this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, we think it more than usually desirable to make some slight provision for the poor and destitute. Many thousands are in want of common necessaries. Many hundreds of thousands are in want of common comforts. And there are no prisons. Yeah, yes. Plenty of prisons, but under the impression that they scarcely furnish Christmas cheer of mind or body to the undefending multitude, a few of us are endeavouring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. We choose this time because it is a time of all others when want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. What can I put you down for? Nothing. You wish to be anonymous? I wish to be left alone, gentlemen. Since you ask me what I wish, that is my answer. I do not make merry myself at Christmas, and I cannot afford to make idle people merry. I help to support the prisons and the workhouses. They cost enough. Those who are badly off must go there. Well, many can't go there. And many would rather die. If they'd rather die, they should hurry up and do it. And decrease the surplus population. Good afternoon. At length, the hour of shutting up the counting house arrives. With an ill will, Scrooge dismounts from his stool and tacitly admits the fact to the expectant clerk in the tank who instantly snuffs out his candle and puts on his cap. You'll be wanting him all day tomorrow, I suppose. Ah. Uh, well. If it's quite convenient, sir. Well, it's not convenient. It's not fair. If I was to stop you half a crown for it, you'd think yourself mightily ill-used, I'll be bound. What? Y yes, sir. And yet you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work? Well, it's only, it's only once a year, sir. Well, a poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. Still, I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier the next morning. The clerk promised that he would. Scrooge walked out with a growl. The office was closed in a twinkling. And the clerk, with the long ends of his white comforter dangling down below his waist, for he boasted no great coat, went down a slide. At the end of a line of boys, twenty times in honour of its being Christmas Eve, and ran home as hard as he could pelt to play at blind man's bluff. Scrooge. 
took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern. And having read all the newspapers and beguiled the rest of the evening with his banker's book, he goes home to bed. He lives in chambers which had once belonged to his deceased partner, Jacob Marley. There were a gloomy suite of rooms in a lowering pile of building up a yard.